Welcome to this week's episode of FSN During Quarantine, the single greatest reality show to ever hit the airwaves. So let's go straight to a live insider's look at the drama, the epic real-time story, the edge-of-your-seat action that is FSN During Quarantine. We miss you. Hey, FSN, we miss you. We miss you. Hey, everyone, welcome back once again to FSN Online. So glad that you are joining us today. And we do, we miss you. We miss you like crazy. We cannot wait until we can get back together in person and worship together. Hey, we know this, this stuff is getting tiresome for a lot of you all. We know that um, it's kind of wearing you out a little bit, but we just want to encourage you today to keep your head up, keep plugging away, keep allowing God to do awesome things in your life and seeking Him. And uh, we just know that He has good things in store for us, no matter what the circumstances are, whether we're in quarantine or not. So just want to encourage you to keep plugging away, keep your head up today. And as always, if you need anything, you can contact us anytime. You can go to our website, fortscottnazarene.org. All of our contact info is there, our phone number. You can call us in the office during the week. You can shoot us an email. If you're a Facebooker, you can, you can message us on there. We would love to hear from you. Whether you need anything or not, we'd just love to hear how things are going and what God is doing in your life and in the life of your family. While you're at fortscottnazarene.org, if you're a regular part of the ministry here, we would love it if you would just continue to give financially during this time. And you can give online right there at that website by clicking Give Online. We're plugging away full steam ahead, even though we're not meeting on Sunday morning. We're doing anything and everything we can to continue to be a resource to our community and invest in people and uh, build the kingdom and fulfill the mission that God has given us as a church. We are so glad that you've tuned in today. Thanks so much for joining us at FSN Online. Can lift us from the grave. 
This is Pastor Virgil. If you're new to FSN, I'm uh, one of the pastors here at uh, Fort Scott Nazarene, and you just met uh, Pastor Jeff and his wife Mariah as they led us into worship. We're in our second week of a series of conversations we're calling Incredible Families. And I believe that God wants you and me to have incredible families, whether you're a parent, grandparent, aunt, and uncle. This gives us an opportunity, this time gives us an opportunity that we can invest in the younger generations. And 
and throughout this series, we want to give us tools of how we can become the superheroes in our families. Because I know without a shadow of a doubt that God wants us to have incredible families. Last week, we looked at through the power of Jesus, your family, whether in the home or not, can be reclaimed and redeemed. It's about drawing a line in the sand and saying, no matter what it was yesterday, it doesn't have to be that way tomorrow. Jesus can redeem our families, and most importantly, he can redeem our past mistakes, those things that you and I have done that have caused us, that led us away from Jesus. But first, we have to have a right relationship with Jesus as we come into our families. Last week, we talked about this concept of of family worship, and, and how did that go? How did you create that, put that into your family rhythm. Maybe it didn't go so well. You know, it's, it's really difficult to create a new rhythm, but I encourage you, continue at it, continue working at it. Your family is most important, and it's part of being a, an incredible family. In Incredibles 2, there's a scene that uh, Edna Mode, uh, she's talking to Bob, uh, one of the parents, Mr. Incredible, and he's just talking about the struggles that he's having of being a parent. I want you to watch this scene. You look ghastly, Robert. I haven't been sleeping. I broke my daughter. They keep changing math. We needed double A batteries, but I got triple A's, and now we still need double A batteries. Put one red thing in a load of whites, and now everything's pink. And I think we need eggs. Done properly, parenting is a heroic act. Done properly. I am fortunate that it has never afflicted me. Edna Mode said this, done properly, parenting is a heroic act, done properly. And it's that, 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 that phrase, done properly, that brings this fear into us because we do. We want to parent properly. We want to do it the best. But a lot of times we have this fear of failure. I remember bringing my kids home from the hospital. They didn't hand me a book of how to raise a newborn, how to raise a toddler, how to raise a child. When my eldest turned 13 years old. I wasn't given this book of how to raise a teenager. A lot of times this fear of failure causes us to do a lot of things. And so the main idea of today is this. The fear of failure leaves us powerless when we parent out, parent in our own power. The fear of failure leaves us powerless when we parent in our own power. Power. There's a story in Mark chapter 9. So if you have your Bibles this morning, go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 9, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first four uh, books of the, of the New Testament. There's one parent in this story, but it illustrates two different parenting styles. The first parenting style is a Christ centered parenting, and the second one is self centered parenting. So as we work through this story, as we work through this, this, this gospel story, there's two different, I want you to watch for the two different parenting styles. And this fear of failure leads us, it, it, it propels us to these two different ways of parenting, either a Christ-centered style or a self-centered style. We fear when our kids begin to walk that they're, they're going to run into things, they're going to bump their heads, and so we're constantly watching them. There, there's fears we watch our child step onto the bus or, or walk into the school for the very first time. There's fear that grips us as we hand our kids the keys for the very first time as they drive by themselves. And we a lot of times we fear that first breakup. We fear that, that first relationship that goes wrong. And, and we fear at graduation there's this, this sense of loss because we're, we're, we're fearful that we haven't prepared our kids to for this world, for the future. And fear is an incredible driving force. It either drives us to something or drives us away from something. And these two parenting styles can be summarized in simply this. How it reflects me or how it reflects Jesus. These two parenting styles, either Christ-centered parenting or self-centered parenting, can summarize in how it reflects on me or how it reflects Jesus and these fears drives both, but it's how we respond to fear as to how we're going to parent. Let me tell you, I don't know a single parent that has not at one point been experienced or driven by fear when it comes to parenting. 
So in John chapter 9, there's, there's a, a, a lot to read, so I encourage you to stay with me. In John chapter 9, we're going to start in verse 14. It says this. And when they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet them. Then Jesus says this, what are you arguing with them about? And it says, a man in the crowd answered, teacher, I brought my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it sees him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked the disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. They could not. Then Jesus says, O oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring me the boy. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Then Jesus, he looks at the father and says, How long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. He has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, have pity on us and help us. If I can, Jesus said, everything is possible for him who believes. In verse 24, immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit, you deaf and mute spirit, he said. I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, come out and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. In verse 28, well, after Jesus had gone indoors, the disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? And he replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. And some translations say say only by prayer and fasting. Mark chapter 9 is is this large narrative of the story of Jesus. And, And right before this passage happened, Jesus and three of his disciples uh, Peter, James, and John were on the mountaintop, and they had the, this mountaintop experience, of the mountaintop of a transfiguration where Jesus shone himself in the Spirit. And they were walking off of this mountaintop into this valley, and that fact right there, a lot of us parents can understand. There are times that we're on the mountaintop. It seems like everything is going right in our family, but then there's other times that we are in the valley, and it just seems like nothing's going right, nothing we can do. It seems like we're at odds, we're, we're, we're butting heads with our children. And Jesus is coming down and he finds the rest of the disciples having this argument with a group of religious people. They see him and they come running to him and he asks, what are you arguing about? He asks his disciples, who are you arguing with? What are you arguing about? You see, the disciples had failed at casting out this demon, this spirit. They had publicly failed right in front of everybody, right in front of these religious people. And the crowd is quiet and it says that the father's boy speaks up. He says, Jesus, my son, I brought him to you to cast out the spirit, but I had to settle for your disciples, and they were of no help. They couldn't do anything. And he explains to Jesus that my boy has possessed with the spirit, and since he was a little boy, he has been unable to speak, and it throws him into seizures, and your disciples could not help him. And we're kind of a, a little put back of Jesus' response. We, we kind of anticipate a, a response of compassion. Is like, hey, that's all right. We're going to take care of it. I'm going to help you. But his response is this. Oh, unbelieving generation, how, must, how long must I be with you? You see, we have this ability to, to, to see the whole story. And, and we look at the disciples and we're like, why would the disciples act like this? They, they know that Jesus is there. We would never respond the way the disciples were. But in the context, I th- I'm so thankful that in the Gospels that the disciples are part of the story. Because I find myself so many times being like the disciples. 
I'm trying to do things on my own power. There's a lot of times I had this unbelief. I had these, these arguments with people about who is greatest. And, and I, I see myself, I identify myself so many times with the disciples because there are times I can become faithless. I can become unbelieving. I'm faithless and unbelieving that, that certain situations or certain people really can change. It says that Jesus calls for the boy. And as soon as the boy or the spirit in the boy sees Jesus, it says he throws him into this convulsion. And I can imagine the father watching this scene, a scene that he's probably seen so many times. This boy throws himself into this convulsion, the spirit within him, and not being able to do anything about it. And publicly, people are watching this scene. And Jesus asks, how long has this happened? And you can hear the desperation in this father's voice. So imagine you're the father, and you're helpless, and right before this whole big crowd, your boy is on the ground convulsing. And imagine the, the, the sense of loss. And Jesus asks, how long has this been going on? And he just simply says, since childhood. And he says a lot of times it cast him into the fire, it cast him into water. His father, his mother and I can never leave him alone. There's always someone who has to be watching him because we're afraid for him. We, don't, we want to keep him safe. We've tried everything that we can. And Jesus, that's, that's why we are here. And as parents, our fear of failure, we can do the same thing with our kids. We can insulate them or isolate them. And we, a lot of times we can become like, helicopter parents that that anytime we see our child struggle that we be swoop in and try to correct the situation because we don't want them to experience pain or hardship or or maybe many of us are like lawnmower parents we're 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 mowing this path we're 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 picking out the things that that would potentially hurt our kids and we don't want them to experience those things instead of allowing them to struggle allowing them to learn through the process and it's because of our fear, fear of failure. We find ourselves desperate for something because we know that this is not going to help long term a parenting under our own power. And the father knows that this isn't going to work. That this isn't the answer for his boy. And he pleads with Jesus. And he asks Jesus, have pity on us. We are at our wits end. We don't know what to do. Jesus, if you can. Have pity, us, pity on us. And again, Jesus gives this response that we don't anticipate from Jesus. He says, if I can, anything is possible for those who believe. I'm sure the Father, with years of frustration, sleepless nights, times when his son is thrown into the fire, he himself jumps into the fire to save his son. When his, his son is thrown into the water, him or his wife jumps into the water to save his son. He prays this authentic and honest prayer. I love this prayer. And he says, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Well, many times, there's many times that you and I have probably prayed that prayer God, help me. Help my unbelief. I do believe that you can, but there's a sense of me that believes that, that maybe the situation never can change. Let me tell you, God can answer our prayers even when we don't have full belief. It's a parent that's pleading with God for a son who wanted desperately for a son to change. It says that in that moment, this crowd begins to gather around. It says in that moment, Jesus cast out that demon. And, and it throws this boy, boy so violently to the ground that the people who are witnessing it think that the son, this boy is dead. And we see the one who has all power over all situation show a sign, a gesture of compassion and kindness. It says that he stoops down. He takes the boy by the hand and he lifts him up and he restores him back to his father. Just imagine the father receiving his son back who is in right mind. That he's hearing his, his son's voice for the very first time. And imagine this boy 
who has been deaf and mute for years, hearing his father for the very first time, maybe for years. And we see these videos of kids who, who have their hearing restored and, and just the emotion that they experience when they hear their parents for the very first time. And they're experiencing something that's bigger than anything beyond themselves that they have ever experienced. And this fear that this father had, this fear of failure, many times this public display of failure, has driven him to the feet of Jesus because he realized he was powerless to do anything for his son. And we don't have the power You and I don't have the power to protect our kids. And so that fear should drive us to a Savior. That fear should drive us to Jesus. And we see in this story what our fear must do. Our fear should drive us to a Christ-centered parenting. But many of us, we parent with the attitude of the disciples. What does it say the disciples do when they gathered with Jesus privately? They asked, Jesus, why could we not cast out this demon? They were embarrassed. They were publicly embarrassed. It, it, this wasn't something new for the disciples. They had many times cast out demons before. But in front of a great crowd, in front of the religious leaders, they were publicly embarrassed. And Jesus says this. He said, this kind can only come out by prayer and by fasting. Jesus was saying, you you guys don't get it. You don't get it. You're trying to do this under your own power instead of the power that I have given to you. You see, you and I need to come to the realization like the Father did that we are powerless, that we can't parent parent under our own power, that there is a power that is greater than us that helps us as we parent. But when we come to parenting, as oftentimes that we do, when it comes to the fear of failures, we have to assess our hearts. And if we're honest, we we fear in parenting a lot more out of our pride than out of the power of Jesus. We find ourselves many times being led in a kid-centered families, kid-centered homes instead of a Christ-centered homes. A lot of times as families, we, we attach our identity as a family to a certain skill or ability or a talent that our child has. Instead of saying that we can't live a life apart from Christ, We pursue things that lead our kids away from Christ, and we sacrifice their souls in the process. Instead of having Christ-centered parenting, Christ-centered kids, we produce self-centered kids. As if having a leg up on a competition or a leg up on an athletic ability is something that can sustain the soul of our kids. When we produce these things that we want them to perform publicly, But privately, we produce kids that are so far from God. And when we do that, we begin to parent as a self-centered parent. We parent out of our pride of what we can get, of how people look at us when our kid performs at a certain level. As they they look at us of of the sacrifice that that we are making for our kids for their, maybe for times of their well-being But then our pride is broken when our kids make choices that are unwise, that make a public mistake, and people look at us differently. And because we have parent out of self-centered parenting instead of Christ-centered parenting, we parent of correcting behavior instead of correcting the heart. So in the story of Mark chapter 9, there's there's two different styles of parenting. Again, excuse me. And the disciples and the father have both failed miserably publicly. Disciples in trying to cast out this demon, the father for years of the attitude of his son, of what his son did, did was doing. And it led the disciples to arguing of, of whose fault it was. Who, who, who is the reason? How does it reflect upon me? But for the father... His fear of failure, his sense of 
powerlessness led him to the feet of Jesus, knowing Jesus was the only one who could fix it. And so there's two things that you and I can learn as we look at the story of Mark chapter 9. The first one is this, is that we have to go to Jesus first. We have to go to Jesus first. You see, if I don't go to Jesus first, I fail my family miserably. When I, power, when I parent under my own power, you see, I must first know Jesus before I can do anything else. Because there's times that I let myself rise up, where my pride rises up. When I, when I do things out of, for the eyes of people instead of before the eyes of Jesus and allowing him to guide me. And the second thing is this, is that we have to go to Jesus daily. We have to go to Jesus daily. It's not just a one-time deal, but every single day I've sacrificed myself. I surrender myself and say, Jesus, I give you myself today daily. And many times it looks like going into his word and saying, God, teach me, show me. As we see in the story, the father and son, it, get, it got chaotic before it got better. And a lot of times in our family, sometimes in that chaos, your kids and my kids need to see how we respond in the middle of chaos. And we live our, our faith before kids. And we don't want to produce these cooker cut, cookie cutter plastic Christians. We want to produce authentic followers of Jesus. And so what they need to see is you and I authentically living out our faith. They, they don't want to just see how we react at one, one hour a week on a Sunday morning or when we gather together, but they want to see us every single day as we authentically live out our faith before them. That doesn't mean that we're not going to mess up. There's not doesn't mean that there's not going to be times that we've got to humbly kneel before our kids and say, will you forgive me for the way I acted? We're not going to be perfect. There's only one parent who is perfect, and you and I are not him. Maybe your kids have, have been out of the house and <clears throat> and maybe they've rejected your faith. I heard a story pastor one time talk about a, a, an elderly lady that was in his church. And for 58 years, she prayed for her son who was far away from God. And even years after she had passed away, she never on this earth saw her son come to Jesus. But the pastor tells her the story of how this son was radically transformed and changed because his mother's prayers. Let me tell you, there is still hope for your children. If the thief could receive salvation in an instant, there is no child too far from God that can't be redeemed, that can't be rescued by God. I want to tell you, parents, don't give up. Don't give up on your kids. So as we looked at this story today in Mark chapter 9 of this greater, greater narrative of Jesus, what kind of parent am I going to be? What kind of parent are you going to be? Are we going to respond in fear of, of how other people view us? Or are we going to respond in fear that leads us to the feet of Jesus, that we realize that we can't do this on our own? Holy Father, just thank you for today. Lord, I, I, I thank you for allowing us to invest in the next generation. God, whether it's as a parent or grandparent or an aunt and an uncle, or maybe we just have influence over the younger generation. But God, I just pray that we would parent out of the sense of this knowledge that we can't do it on our own. That we can't do this parenting thing. We can't do this family thing on our own power. And God, that leads us to the feet of Jesus. God, that we receive the power from you. God, I just pray that, 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 that through the yet this series, God, I know that you want us to have incredible families. You want us to have families that thrive, not just survive. You want us to produce kids that are not just cookie-cutter plastic Christians, but dedicated, authentic 
followers of Jesus Christ. God, I just pray. I pray that prayer that that father prayed. God, I believe. Help my unbelief. A lot of those, God, in those times where I struggle as a parent, when I feel like the situation is hopeless, God, I pray that you just give us the strength, the power. God, that we're not doing this to perform before the eyes of people, but God, we're doing this before the eyes of you, and that drives us to you. And we thank you, Father. I just want to give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, FSN, I'm just excited to continue this, this conversation as we look at incredible families. Next week, we're going to look at what it means to have an incredible family within the context of our marriage. We'll see you next week.